I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all creation, human or wild, vast or small, spiritual encounters that move us beyond words. About eight years ago, best-selling novelist Amy Tan turned her keen powers of observation from humans to some neighbors living right on her property. Here's something she discovered. I didn't know this about hummingbirds. First of all, their heart rate, everything about them, they're so fast. They're such a blur of a bird. But at the end of the day, right around dusk, you see them frantically going to feeders and flowers and fueling up. It's one of the best times to see hummingbirds. They have the absolute imperative to get enough in them because they are now going to go into a state called torpor where they hang usually upside down from a branch and their heart rate slows down to about 60 beats a minute. Their temperature lowers. Everything about their metabolism slows down so that they will be able to survive the night. You may know Amy Tan not as an expert on birds, but as the author of six New York Times best-selling novels, including her hit debut made into a movie, The Joy Luck Club. But her latest book, The Backyard Bird Chronicles, is a departure from fiction writing, which many people think of as her calling card. With this new volume, Amy Tan shows from her personal experience how we can at any time turn our attention to what has always been right under our noses. Hummingbirds otherwise usually need to refuel about every 15 minutes. So you can imagine over a seven or eight hour period, a hummingbird going without fuel is in danger. So they fuel up, they slow everything down, they're in this torpor state. It would be really hard to wake them up. It's a time when other birds or cats or rats or humans can just pick them off a branch like a piece of fruit. They will not wake up. Amy Tan's latest project celebrates feathered fowl that fly and eat and hunt and squabble and preen and bathe right in her own backyard. Even tiny hummers that dangle through the night head down in suspended animation. In this book, we get to peek at her nature journal entries, and this is a first from this author, also her own detailed illustrations of creatures she has spent time with in rapt amazement. Now, don't expect a field guide in this new book. It's not that. Amy Tan clearly has a very different task. She's inviting us to join her in slowing down enough to see endless and very particular wonders all around us, whatever happens to show up in our own immediate vicinity. And here's a funny thing she's found. Taking time to be observant enough about neighbors in the natural world, to notice, for example, the active frenzy of hummingbirds at dusk, well, this kind of patient attentiveness to non-human creatures can make us better neighbors to our fellow humans. Amy is a celebrated author whose work has been translated into 35 languages. That doesn't mean she's had a charmed life, though. The thing that in recent years made Amy more attentive to nature and led to her practice of close observation and interaction with backyard birds, and not just birds, by the way, many other creatures as well, was a disease. This deeply personal challenge has involved, obviously, a lot of pain, but also partly because of that pain, a new path and renewed access to some of life's beauty. Here's Amy describing the circumstances that have prevented her from getting out and about as independently as she could before contracting Lyme disease. I developed Lyme disease in 1999, was not diagnosed for four and a half years, and thus I was left with kind of permanent Lyme disease, although it's pretty much in control. I would say that it's equivalent to long COVID. If anybody has experienced that, that's what it's like to have long Lyme. As a result of Lyme disease, I also developed epilepsy. The bacteria went into my brain and caused little 
tiny microstrokes. And those lesions in certain parts of my brain led to epilepsy, which I control with medication. But it meant, because it happened most frequently when I was driving, it meant I could not drive. Now, these were not convulsive seizures, but they impaired my consciousness. They made me sleepy. I had to sleep immediately for at least 15 minutes. I couldn't focus. And so I couldn't drive. And if I wanted to see something wild, (laughs) I would have to limit where I would go. On top of managing her health challenges, Amy Tan recalls that 2016 was a particularly difficult year socially. She became the target of racism in a way that she had never been before. 2016, there was a lot of divisiveness that broke out. It was overt. It was no longer covert little signs that people didn't want you around. It was blatant. And some of it was directed to me, but increasingly toward Asian Americans. And I finally had a real gut reaction, a feeling, a visceral understanding of what it has been like for so many Blacks and Latinos, Muslims, of always having to wonder if somebody is rude to you, is that just because they're having a bad day or is it because they are intolerant? They're racist. And that's a terrible question to ask yourself. You don't want to have that question in your mind. You'd rather think that somebody is plain rude um, or they have a headache. So that disturbed me so much that I was I couldn't get this question out of my head. I needed to do something to break this cycle of thought. Now, this was, of course, a political year as well. And I, I have been involved in doing campaigns and things like that. But I just felt very helpless about this issue. I had to reset myself and do something else. Now, I had always loved to draw when I was a child and even dreamed at age nine that I might secretly become an artist when not practicing as a neurosurgeon as my parents wanted For my future, (laughs) I was reaching the age when I would have retired, and I had always said that I would do something like this indulgent activity when I'm older, Uh, and I decided I would learn to do nature journaling, which includes observation, which I'm quite adept at as a fiction writer, and drawing, and learning what the combination of the two would be like in terms of my relationship with nature. So it wasn't simply a skill. It wasn't simply an activity to get out of my head. It really was to find something greater and more meaningful that it would override these terrible feelings I was having. So in everything you've just said, is it okay for me to infer that you actually wanted to go back to some childhood aims and loves and hopes? It is exactly what your show is called. It was to go back to that period of constant wonder where you are innocent. You're not aware of all the noise around you that concerns your parents, whether it's their income or you know, some problems, anything like that. You are just in a state of wonder. And I remember a period that lasted about three years. We lived in the suburbs and my mother wanted to move every single year. It was her idea of achieving the American dream, you know, this the ladder of success. Well, it was the ladder of new homes. The longest we ever lived in one place was in Santa Rosa and we were half a block from a creek. I would go there all the time and explore what was there. And what I saw was riveting. For example, tadpoles in a little pool of water, a little pool that would have dried up in a few days. And the next day or the day after that, the tadpoles would be there, but they would be dead. But then I would see live ones or I would see a lizard. I would try to catch these creatures I love to catch snakes. 
So it was a time where everything was new. Everything was wondrous. Everything was about life as I'd never seen it and experienced it. I loved to be in nature, to be around no one but what was out there. Being around no one, not being around a mother who was having a fit over something or finding reasons to say she was going to kill herself. You know, this was the noise of the household. And there were times I just needed to be alone, whether it was in my room for two hours or down in a creek. And you can guess which one was much more comforting. So as a grown-up in 2016, living in Sausalito just north of the Golden Gate Bridge above the San Francisco Bay, Amy was dealing with her distress about social ills and racial prejudice and looking for a way to override negativity by retrieving some of the wonders she remembered from childhood. She felt that taking up drawing again should be part of this. For several years, Lyme disease had been shaping her day-to-day reality. She was limited by the type of epilepsy she had, which put the brakes on how far she could go from home and where she could conveniently travel without assistance. But she still felt she needed a way to retreat and heal from these frequent worries and cares. And I realized, hey, I live in this gorgeous place, this yard with all this greenery. I have a green roof. I have oak trees. I have a succulent garden, succulents that flower. I should do my nature journaling in my backyard. And guess what I also saw? I wasn't just doing the plants and the flowers. I started to notice the birds. She came to see her backyard space in almost theatrical terms. The place that I look at the most is my patio because I have the theaters there. There's a fence, the oak trees are over. To my left, massive old, 100-year-old oak trees covered in lichen. And on the other side, on the right side, are a lot of vines and bushes, flowering jasmine and so forth, and a fence and a small tree behind that. This is like the set you would see at an opera. We're seeing the characters arrive, and you see them secretly arriving in the tree, doing a little reconnaissance, landing on the fence, looking around, seeing where it wants to go, the bird wants to go. There came a day when one particular individual, just a single bird, convinced Amy Tan to commit to this new pursuit that she had embarked on. Early on in my watching birds, I noticed hummingbirds going to the feeders quite often. And at one point, I saw an ad that said you could use these hand feeders and lure them to eat out of your hands. And I thought, no, this is a scam. That won't happen. But I thought, you know, why not try? It's cheap. Hope is cheap. So I, I did that. And the first day, I put it on a rail and the hummingbird came pretty quickly to investigate because they're very territorial. The second day, they came again, but they came closer. I started moving it closer and closer toward me. And then I put it on my hand, and I waited. The hummingbird flew right to my hand, landed there, and started to drink. I could feel its scratchy feet on the palm of my hand. It probably weighs as much as a nickel. I mean, they're so light. It looked up at me with these very round black eyes, dipped back down and was feeding. That same hummingbird later rose up and was right in front of my face staring at me with its very sharp bill, fanning its feathers out and then circling me with this loud beating of feathers. The whir of the feathers blowing against my face, I would feel all of that. It's amazing this huge personality that's in such a tiny body. In my mind, that encounter took about two minutes. It might have been 10 seconds. But I was in that suspended state of actual fascination, wonder, amazement. I fell in love with birds. 
I fell in love with the idea that I could look at these birds and they could be part of my lives, but they accepted me. They weren't my friends, but they accepted I was a non-threatening entity and they could come to me. How could you not fall in love with birds after that? Amy took a class to learn and practice how to capture these special visitors on the pages of her nature journal. It was in this class that she met an unlikely mentor, somebody she nearly dismissed. Fiona Galogli. I met her when she was just turning 13, a teenager then. I just thought she was one of these annoying children who would just ceaselessly ask questions. You know, why is the sky blue? Why are trees green? That kind of thing. And I thought, oh, stay away from this girl. You know, (laughs) so annoying. (laughs) She would say her questions aloud. She was like a mind that was in a, in a tornado. Um, And then I found as I started to do this more and more that the whole purpose The whole purpose of doing nature journaling was to be curious and attentive and to ask questions. You don't know the answers. You're never going to know the complete answer. And if you think you do, you will shut off the portal to wonder. But if you're like Fiona, you still wonder like a child about everything you Place yourself back in that moment of innocence where you're going to learn, you're going to discover, and you discover things that make your assumptions of the past wrong. And so that's what Fiona taught me. She's in college now on the East Coast, but when she's around, we always get together and we'll go off and do nature journaling together. Uh, We'll find dead animals And we'll do forensic studies of the animal and try to figure out what happened here, who was the predator, et cetera. And all of it is also done with great appreciation for the sanctity of life. That class on nature journaling was taught by John Muir Laws, Jack Laws, a well-known advocate of the practice of getting outside and documenting what you see. Amy and Fiona and countless other students have been mentored by him in a particular method of observation. It's so fantastic. It's something you can do with anything in life, not just birds. Um, You could do it with people. You could do it in any situation where you're describing what you're seeing. Particularly if you're overexcited about what you're seeing, as Amy Tan often was. I got what's called new bird tachycardia. You know, my heart is racing. I'm shaking. I'm trying to find my phone or my camera so I can take a picture and try to find binoculars so I can get a more close-up look at what this bird looks like. And what I learned to do through nature journaling, which is great for looking at new birds, is I had to call out every significant feature of the bird as fast as I could. So with a hummingbird, it would be, Uh, You know, redhead that changes colors in sunlight. It has graduated feathers from small to growing larger as it feathers move from the bill to going over its head and so on and so forth. I would be calling these things out so I could later go back and draw the bird as best as I could reconstruct it. Jack Laws taught us, as you draw the bird, First, you try to imagine you're touching the bird so that all the shapes of the bird that you're trying to draw tactily gives you that information as well. You feel how large the bird is. You feel that the bird can change its shape. And then the next step is to imagine the life force of the bird. Whatever you think life force means, whatever you think the energy is that the bird has that sustains it. So you feel this Often to me, it feels like a kind of tension because there I am, a human, in front of this bird. And as I draw this bird, as I draw in detail, often I do these portraits of individual birds, as I draw in detail at each level, I think about how those parts of the bird are used. And so being a fiction writer, I am very good at putting myself into the life, the mind, the body of a character that I've made up. I can do the same thing with a bird 
So now, instead of me looking at the bird with my binoculars, I am the bird, and I have to feel my feet. How stable is it on the ground and enabling me to leap up and take off? How is that different if I'm perched on something? I'm a different bird and I'm perched. It's a constant look at all the things that a bird goes through and then putting myself in that. Now, in fiction writing, I have to do the same thing. Every single character, I have to imagine, I have to be in that place. And I realized a number of years ago that imagination is is the closest thing we can do to practice compassion. Because what you're doing is imagining yourself not in this life that you have, this body that you have, these circumstances. You are imagining through fiction, perhaps, that you are the character. You are the person who is in war, facing poverty, loss, grief, all of those things. This is something I try to do with people I meet. It's really hard to do when... Somebody is rude. Somebody is doing something that you think might be racism. But the mandate to a fiction writer is that you have to do it for every single character, no matter how despicable they are. This sense of empathy for an individual, be it a fictional character or an actual human or a live bird that you're hoping to draw with observational and ethical integrity. Well, this changed Amy Tan's view about wildlife conservation and um, also her view of rats. More reflections and stories from Amy Tan yet to come here on Constant Wonder. Her new book is titled The Backyard Bird Chronicles. I'm Marcus Smith. Embark on a whimsical journey with The Appleseed and host Sam Payne. It's one of many shows from the BYU Radio family of podcasts. Wrap yourself in captivating stories, expertly woven by talented storytellers. You'll hear live studio audiences taking immense delight in a broad tapestry of tales, some humorous, others poignantly reflective. The Apple Seed is always a family-friendly experience. It sparks imagination creative enough to make fiction feel like fact and bring real-life events back to life. The Apple Seed. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We now return to Constant Wonder. We're often in conservation concerned with the elimination of a species through changes in the environment or human-caused reasons. And I am very concerned about those things. I'm on the board of the American Bird Conservancy and active with other conservation groups that involve birds. However, what is more important to me is to have that daily feeling that I am connecting with an individual, not a bird, not a crow, not a a towhee or a Buick's red. I'm in communication through my posture, my looks, my gaze. I'm there with an individual. I think that is so important when we look also not just at biodiversity and why we should love nature. I mean, it it starts with our notions of love often start with family. You know, there's this modeling of love. And I think we can get a modeling of that also when we look at individuals and not simply animals, as a kind of animal. That, that we look at people of all races as part of that as well, as individuals. I want to stick with this question of the individual, the importance of the individual. It's easy to do that with panda bears and koala bears and beautiful birds. You also talk about some messy business that has to do with rats and wasps and <laughs> predators and what have you. And and if if we're going to talk ethics, let's talk about your rat traps. Can we yeah, talk about your rat yeah, traps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My rat traps. The rat traps are n- nothing you can buy in a store. The rat traps are two great horned owls. <laughs> now, at one point, 
when I had this massive problem with the rats, I did consider all kinds of means. You get so frustrated. You say, ah, okay, I'm going to break my vow not to use poison because I can't stand this. And I've got a million rats going through my yard. Enter rodents. Stage left, stage right, from every direction. They come because of a common bird behavior. These villains of Amy's backyard theater apparently have appetites. Who knew? Every person who has a bird feeder knows that some of the birds will take seeds, like sunflower seeds, in a feeder, and they will pick a seed and throw it on the ground, pick another seed, throw it on the ground, and they just do this about five times before they take another one. So there you have five perfectly good seeds, or if you have 20 finches at your feeder, you have hundreds of these seeds all over the ground. And you get fledglings that are not able to really hunt that well, eating up some of the mess, but you get rats and very happy rats. The whole situation would be easier if the birds were more tidy. Now, everybody I know has seen this and they talk about it and they ask, why do birds do that? And I've tried different ways to not let seeds fall down. But part of it is I just want to understand why are they so profligate? Why are they so wasteful? And I did find the answer. A friend of mine is a wonderful biologist, Bernd Heinrich, whose books uh, I've read and are wonderful. And he said there is a reason. He did the research. He painstakingly weighed every single seed and et cetera, and also probably got the seeds that were in the bird. He weighed them. And what the conclusion was is they are searching for seeds that are more dense in oil, and the way they measure that is by the depth of the seed, not the length. So I'm watching that, and and I'm I'm appreciating now much more how smart those birds are in being able to. It's like our going to the store and picking out a watermelon. You know, we're not going to just take the first watermelon that's there. We're going to tap it and, and see. So that's what they're doing. Everybody, you know, is part of this whole cycle of eating, including the rats. And they would come out even in the daytime. They would come out in larger numbers at night, go running across the patio like they were conducting a a nighttime marathon. I, you know, I was at my wit's end. You could get rat traps, of course. Rat traps are the most humane way of exterminating rats as opposed to glue traps and poison, poison, which would kill raptors that eat these poisoned rats. You could do catch and release, but catch and release is also not ethical. Did you know that? It's not ethical. I mean, I keep finding this thing out and then you're saying, now what else can I do? So they're not ethical because when you remove wildlife, rats even, from their social system, from their homes, their tunnels, their food source, and you put them somewhere else, out in the country, some beautiful place you found for them, they're alone. They don't have a social system to interact with, to cooperate with, to tunnel, to find food, to stay warm, to do all those things that rats do as a community, and they die. They die of exposure, starvation, etc. So it's not a humane way to get rid of rats. Ultimately, I decided what I had to do was be very tidy. I had to keep the rats from climbing up poles to get to the food, and I had to create ways to catch any drop food so it wouldn't go to the ground, and I would sweep up whatever. So that reduced the number of rats that came in the yard. But, you know, it takes a million times for a rat to to be dissuaded from a former food source. <laughs> The rat problem, though, was solved by the two great horned owls who moved into the trees above our patio. And suddenly there were fewer rats, and then there were none. (laughs) Those owls stayed there for at least one of them for eight months. And that was enough time for them to do the extermination. Now, sad to say, for the first time, I saw a rat yesterday. 
I actually have, somebody gave me one of these bird cameras um, where you can see if a bird's landed on the feeder. And Well, it's so sensitive, the motion detector, that it was detecting things that were going beyond this, this particular camera feeder. It was, it was looking at my feeders behind it, and it recorded at night a rat climbing all over the cage. I don't think it ate anything because what I put in there is very, very spicy suet. To a large mammal like me, this might seem like trivial information, but it's not at all trivial to small, wild mammals. They generally react very negatively to spices like hot pepper. Amy clued me in to this fact, as well as the important detail that birds just don't register pain from eating pepper— which makes it a great addition for lacing bird feed if you want to deter unwanted raiders like small mammals. But Amy has learned that spicy suet apparently isn't such a surefire way to shock a rat's system and send it packing. The squirrels hate that, so they don't even bother. But the rats, they're so adaptable. The rats in the past have eaten suet that the first time they ate it, they sort of jumped in the air. Have you ever seen somebody in a restaurant who who ate wasabi like it was mustard or regular ketchup? They just slathered on their food and they put it in their mouth and you see their eyes kind of bulge and then they leap up out of their chair and they go running. That's what happened with the rats when they first bit into this stuff. But then they came back. It was like, okay, I can deal with it. It's an acquired anyway. taste. It's an acquired taste, just like Chinese Sichuan food is an acquired taste. You know, they are able to deal with it. Squirrels, no. Most other mammals, no. But rats, that is why they're so prolific, why they are the ultimate survivors. I have to grant that. Now, one of the ethical questions I had to say to myself is, do I hate these rats simply because they seem kind of dirty and, you know, I know they spread diseases, bubonic plague and all of that. But we have rats as pets. I once had a rat as a pet and we love those rats as pets. Now, what is the difference between a pet rat and a wild rat in your yard? Well, they're leaving poop all over your yard, of course. No, I, you know, so I had to ask myself how much compassion do I feel toward creatures it has to do with where they are on some evolutionary scale or the animal kingdom you know do I feel less compassion for a rat because it likes to eat food rats have to eat you know but it's eating my bird food so do I feel that that rat deserves to die these were the kinds of moral questions I found myself asking daily and I was glad to ask those questions At what point does our compassion stop? Does it stop at mammals? Do we feel compassion for frogs and lizards and snakes? How about a mealworm that is struggling to get away, knowing what its future is going to be, which is into a bird's mouth? It is showing something that may be fear. I don't know. But if that is the case... Shouldn't I feel compassion for those mealworms? I had to look at inconsistencies and say whether that was okay or whether I had to be absolutely consistent in all of this. As an example, I also looked at wasps and they were eating the mealworms and the mealworms were scared. Then they were blocking the birds from getting the food. I set up a wasp trap. Wasps went in there. They started to drown. I could hear them. I could see their frantic movements. And suddenly I felt terrible because I had caused this distress in these animals. Well, in former days, I would just say, good, I caught them. (laughs) Walk away. Great. I hope I get a hundred of them. But now I'm looking at them and I see these other wasps go around and they are buzzing. And it seems to me they're saying, Betty, hang on. We're going to get help and get you out of there. And then suddenly all of the wasps flew away in a half second. And I thought, what happened? Did the wasps in the trap say, 
no, go save yourself. She's going to kill you right now. I mean, I don't know. But I started going through these scenarios and it was really pulling at my conscience. There's an expression that I, I really dislike as a result of looking at birds. And that is that whenever you see a bird or any animal that has been killed, you hear people say, it's the circle of life. The circle of life, yes, it's true that we have, there are prey and predators, we all have to eat, etc. But the circle of life, to me, has been used too often to block off our emotions, to say to ourselves, we don't have to feel bad, you know, because it was necessary to happen, that it had to happen. Circle of life. Circle of life favors the species that are predators. But we shouldn't just feel nothing about the death of animals. We can feel a little bit of sadness or just compassion saying, well, there goes another individual. Thank you for your service. (laughs) Thank you for your beauty. Thank you for providing food for these other birds. But I want to feel more. That's what nature watching nature taught me. I want to see more and I want to feel more deeply. That is part of my meaning in life, to feel deeply and to try fruitlessly to understand what life is about. And I say fruitlessly in a good way. It's the fact that I want to keep asking the question. I want to keep observing. What do I feel toward others? What do I feel in nature? What do I feel when I'm threatened, when I feel survival is an issue? It's a good mirror, in a way, of my morality, my ethics, things that I haven't really had to pull at in myself for a very long time. I keep thinking, well, I'm a very smart person. You know, I've gone through things. And I realized being out in the yard, being exposed to something new, There are many more ways that I can examine these contradictions in my life. I think it is very good to be uncomfortable. A novelist worth reading, an artist like Amy Tan, is never going to be dishonest or avoidant, I think, about things that are uncomfortable or contradictory. That's all kind of the lifeblood of art, isn't it? In fact, many of the same dramatic tensions that we like in good storytelling can be found in scenes from nature. We've heard Amy describe some for us. We've heard her talk of hungry owls and rats in some human's backyard, hers, which instantly called to mind a poem my wife has often read to me. It's one of our favorites, actually, from one of our favorite poets, Richard Wilbur. It's titled A Barred Owl. And the poem contains a blunt description of natural predation, the kind of thing that makes so many people squeamish. An owl's meal freshly caught is described by Wilbur as some small thing in a claw, born up to some dark branch and eaten raw. Well, Amy makes her view clear about the need for us to acknowledge an animal's suffering. Maybe not intervening at all, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but in our decision-making, never losing our compassion. She pulled some of these important strands together for me when she dipped into some details from her own spiritual journey. I have to say, having been raised by a very devout minister, The answers that were provided to me or the way the world was to be viewed were pretty much black and white. You know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. You should feel this, you shouldn't feel that. And now I do think there is much value in having a framework for our morality, our spirituality. I think what happened to me as I went through life and saw contradictions I started to ask my own questions. What I came around to in many instances were the same things that were taught to me growing up as a Christian. For example, things having to do with kindness. Kindness is, I think, the number one thing you want to find in a person, you know, immediately. So anyway, 
my immersion into nature in an intensive way has brought back these questions. Being out there is not me passively enjoying beauty. It's really wondering and asking these questions about myself. Some of these questions are bittersweet and very personal, as we learned when Amy Tan was on the line with us. As it so happened, our appointment to tape with her coincided very closely with her loss of a dear friend. What makes life so precious? And what does death signify in that framework of things? Now, I'm thinking about all of this because one of my dear friends who I met back in 81, who was very influential in my life, and I did two books with, just died. Gretchen Shields illustrated Amy Tan's children's books, The Moon Lady and The Chinese Siamese Cat. There's a belief that some people have. I'm a little skeptical, but I I love the idea that a person you have loved will come back as a bird to say, hey, I'm free, I'm doing great, but it has to be a really different bird that I've never noticed before for me to think, ah, Is that my friend Gretchen? So anyway, it's one of these cultural beliefs around the world, actually. I I don't know whether you would say it, it means something to people in a spiritual way. But what I think is universal is that from birds, we do find a combination of things. Like if you have grief, you look at a bird. And you find this freedom and this continuation and beauty. If you have suffered something that is devastating, you look at birds and you think about how they survive, how really clever they are to be able to survive in this world. So that is my feeling in the last week, seeing new life, seeing what's going on, and then being immersed in the memories I have of this person by her own words Her mission was to be surrounded by beauty and to make beauty. Amy Tan pursues the creation of beauty in her own way, which has always included words, of course, but now with this new book, she offers some of her drawings, too. To me, that kind of artistic visual production would be incredibly daunting, but where there's a will, there's a way, which is where I went with my final question in our conversation. I'm going to do an analogy to my garden, and this has to do with your own motivation, your your tenacity, and sticking with this over time in the future, because I do a lot of planting. There are times when I do experience fatigue. I think, I'm never going to do another tray of seeds as long as I live, just because I'm tired. But the truth of the matter is, I'm never put off of it, really, because once I'm rested, I go at it again. And I'm wondering about your motivation for the future or if there's something you could just say about, well, back to constant wonder, the idea that the wonder won't end. I have had more recently that feeling where I have not been doing as much nature journaling. But there was a reason I realized, and that was I was on book tour. I only do nature journaling when I'm looking at my backyard. But even beyond that, here I am home, there's my yard, there's my birds, and I haven't been doing that. And it's because because of the book, The Backyard Bird Chronicles, it's not private anymore. And I realized what I really valued as well in my observing my birds, being in the backyard with my birds, was that absolute privacy of what I was feeling and seeing, and I'm not talking about it to people as I'm doing it. You know, being a public person really stifles me from writing, from seeing, from doing a lot of things. So I have to take myself back to that place where I'm a private person and get rid of the noise. And then when I think that no one else is going to ever see what I'm writing or drawing, then I can do it again. It has to do with what is it that I originally got out of it that made it so irresistible? And I realize part of it is the quiet and the privacy. Thanks to Amy Tan for her willingness to share insights and observations from her private backyard with us. Her newest book is titled The Backyard Bird Chronicles. 
This episode was produced by Tenery Taylor with help from Elaine Scott and sound design by Josh Fouts. If you like what you're hearing here on Constant Wonder, please leave us a five-star rating or a friendly review on Apple Podcasts. Share this episode with a friend. All of this helps us to continue to bring you great stories. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. Have you ever wished you could build stronger relationships to people who might not think exactly the way you do, or maybe bridge divides in communication with them, but you've had the feeling that this is a real struggle? Maybe you're looking for information about how to make it happen, and the question is, of course, how? Well, there is a podcast I think you're going to love. It's called Uncomfy, Sticking with Moments that Challenge Us. It's an audio and video podcast that comes to you from the BYU Radio family. And on Uncomfy, real people share real stories, insights from moments that challenged their personal perspectives. And instead of getting angry or shutting down, they stuck with the discomfort. Might have been getting tough feedback from a close friend. Maybe it was choosing to hear out a colleague who didn't share their politics. These are voices of people who chose to Stay open and curious, and in the end, they were very glad that they did. New episodes of Uncomfy drop every Wednesday. You can listen or watch on the BYU Radio app or wherever you get your podcasts.